session 79, The Song of the Cell, Siddharth Mukherjee in conversation with William Dalrymple. Siddharth Mukherjee is a famed oncologist, biologist, and celebrated Pulitzer Prize winning author. His most recent book, The Song of the Cell, examines the basic autonomous unit that makes up all organisms. Steeped in scientific research and visual metaphors of cell systems, Mukherjee's words create a lucid and vivid picture of the discovery of cells and our understanding of them. In conversation with festival co-director and historian William Dalrymple, Mukherjee presents a panoramic saga that combines memoir, history, and science as it attempts to answer the questions of what it means to be alive. Siddharth Mukherjee is a pioneering physician, oncologist, and author who has redefined a public discourse on human health, medicine, and science a profoundly influential voice in the scientific community. His Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer, earned him the 2011 Pulitzer Prize. His latest book, The Song of the Cell, has been named a New York Times Notable Book of 2022. William Dalrymple is the author of Wolfson Prize winning White Mughal Stuff, Cooper Prize winning The Last Mughal, and The Hemingway and Kapuscinski Prize winning Return of a King. His book, The Anarchy, was shortlisted for the Duke of Wellington Medal, the Tata Book of the Year, and the Historical Writers Association Award, and won the 2020 Arthur Ross Medal from the US Council of Foreign Relations. He has been awarded five honorary doctorates, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Asiatic Society, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and has held visiting lectureships at Princeton, Brown, and Oxford, where he's currently an honorary Bodleian Fellow. He was presented with a President's Medal by the British Academy and was named one of the world's 50 Thinkers for 2020 by Prospect Magazine. He's a founder and co-director of Jaipur Literature Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Siddharth Mukherjee and William Dalrymple. One bit of my biography that was left out in that was the fact that I failed my biology O-level. <laughs> So I'm the natural choice to uh, uh, talk to my old friend Siddharth. Uh, but uh, he kindly and flatteringly asked me to do this, so forgive any uh, scientific and uh, biological uh, nonsense that you hear from me over the next hour. It is particularly daunting to talk biology at whatever level with one of the most remarkable people of my entire generation. What you heard read out in that extraordinary biography of Siddhartha was just one side of his life, which is his writing life. What was not mentioned is that as well as this extraordinary, successful, non-fiction career, uh, which is you know, by far, he is by far the most successful non-fiction writing Indian in history. Uh, there is a very, very strong um, uh, fiction tradition in this country. Uh, but surprisingly few people from here win the big prizes of non-fiction, and Siddhartha has won them all. But that is just one aspect of his biography. He's also a practicing doctor uh, who heals people on a regular basis from the horrible disease of cancer. He also runs one of the leading cancer research labs, the Mukherjee Lab, uh, which is um, patenting and pioneering new cures for cancer on a, on a separate basis. Um, and on top of all that, he's a spectacular musician uh, and has toured with his band, the Jog Blues, uh, and sung Drupad and Hindustani vocals in some of the great concert halls of the world. So this is no uncommon mind that we are grappling with here. It's all made up. <laughs> we should also say the other 
the funniest thing about Sinatra is at the end of all that, it's his wife that got the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. <laughs> That wasn't made up. <laughs> and um, the couple were named recently by Vogue as the most brilliant couple in town, the town being New York. Uh, and they are an extraordinary double act. But this new book is the third book of Siddhartha's, which deals with, first dealt with cancer, the second with genes, and the third with the cell. And in a sense, they form a trilogy. Uh -huh. um, very much tackling the areas uh, that you've dealt with as a uh, practitioner of medicine and as a researcher. But the astonishing thing about this writing is that dealing with very complex science, he writes with such grace and narrative flow, with metaphors so beautiful that even a scientific moron such as myself can understand, get interested, and uh, begin to comprehend the complex science which he is describing. It's a spectacular mixture of science, a history of science, and a history of, the, of, of scientists, and uh, a notebook, in a sense, of a practitioner uh, dealing with the business uh, that he's writing about. And as anyone in this audience that ever wants to learn how to write non-fiction, about any complex subjects could learn the art from this book. Forget going on writer's courses, just read a book by Siddhartha Mukherjee and you'll be well on your, uh, on your way to understanding how this is done. To get straight to the business of cells, you use the phrase here, a life within a life, an independent living being, a unit that forms part of the whole a living building block contained in a larger living being. What do you exactly mean by that? So, um, oh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, thank William, you for coming. Uh, <laughs> um, let, uh, to answer the question, I, I, I suppose I should give you a little bit of the genesis of the book and, and why this book, and, and uh, why this book for, for everyone. Um, why this book for a historian, why this book for um, anyone else. Um, the, uh, the back story of all of this goes back to an idea that I've been toggling with for a while, which is the idea of the universality of laws in, in the sciences, in the social sciences, and, and other disciplines, in history, etc. cetera. Um, and there was a, th there's a feeling among biologists that we're sort of the third degree of science. Um, physics being sort of a little bit ahead of us, chemistry being a little bit ahead of us, and, and we're the people who bring the physicists their coffee um, and, um, because they're, they're full of laws. Um, but it turns out that, in fact, if you look at the world of the living, uh, the living world, um, there are three extraordinarily um, universal laws that sweep through the living world. Um, the first is the theory or law, if you want to call it, of evolution. And in fact, you can use evolution now not only to understand biology, you can use evolution to understand social sciences, economics, potentially even history. Um, there's something about this idea of evolution that really sort of strikes you. And there are a thousand books on it, the many I would recommend. Um, and, and of course, you know, they've really kind of converted this uh, this field into, into, into popular literature. Um, the second is the universality of genetics, the genetics law, the laws of genetics. And again, there are a thousand books on genetics, um, including my own book, The Gene, and in, Intimate History. The third, um, just as important, is the universality of, of cell theory. That all living beings, and we'll come back to this over and over again, that, that first of all, all living beings are made of cells, and that all diseases... Vegetables and animals. Yeah, vegetables, animals um, <laughs> are made of cells. And, um, and that all, cell, all illness, all pathology, is ultimately cellular pathology. Very powerful, sweeping statement about all living beings. Now, unlike the first two, evolution and, um, and, ge and genetics, cells, I thought, had been a little bit gypped. 
um, there wasn't a book. Um, and this is, again, similar to the Emperor of All Maladies. There wasn't a book about cancer, so someone had to write it. Um, there wasn't, a, and, and so, you know, there's, there's certainly some books about cell biology and cell theory, but there really isn't a way that you can bring people into this spectacular revolution of the understanding of the human body, of illness, of wellness, of normalcy, et cetera, it's, you know, and, and, and all its dimensions. Um, and that's why, you know, I began to sort of explore this. And that's why this idea of, you know, what is a cell? A cell is the least um, autonomous unit of life. Um, and most people, I would imagine, in, in the audience know what that, that is. But there, our understanding sort of stops there. But there's so much more, and so much more that we've learned uh, in, the, in, the, in the ensuing decades since that discovery. And that's, the, that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the beginning of the book. And the title, The Song of the Cell, this is one that runs through the book. You keep coming back to this. Obviously, you're a musician, and, and, <clears throat> and this is language that comes to you. But explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so there are two songs. I mean, the, the title of this book came very late um, in the genesis of the book. I mean, I don't know how you title your books, uh, Willie, but um, I tend to title my books right at the end. I, I sort of come to them right at the end. Um, and there are really two songs, I think, that the book refers to. The first song, and it's a, it's a very important idea again, is that, again, you know, we come back to this idea of, of genes. There's been so much written and talked about genes and genetics, um, importantly. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the, the gene is, a is encoded in a molecule in DNA. And it's lifeless without a cell. Uh, it's the cell that brings it to life, just like a musician brings a score to life. Um, this analogy remains throughout the book. Um, the cells in your neurons and the cells in, in your immune system, the cells that you know, um, run uh, the various parts of your body, they all inherit the same genome. And yet, like a musician or a symphony, or to take an analogy from Indian music, if you present the same rag to different uh, individuals, they'll sing out a completely different song, even though the structural element of that song is the same. And so that's the first idea that Sort of, that's the first song of the cell. But then I was, uh, while I was reading this book, I was inspired by, um, I was reading also um, Amitav Ghosh's book, The Nutmeg's Curse. And he has this lovely passage in it uh, in which he describes um, a very eminent botanist who goes into um, the forest, into the rainforest with a young man. And the young man says, you know, I can name all the individual plants in this forest but I can't tell the songs that run between them. And so there's a second kind of song that, this, that cells, I think, sing, sing to each other. And that's a song that we don't know yet. And, and I'll just give you one example. Um, it's a very provocative example. Um, the, the English surgeon, Steve, Stephen Paget, um, in the late 1800s asked the question, if the liver and the spleen are two organs that sit next was, to each other. This was fascinating. Uh, yeah, yes. I love this example. So uh, if the liver and the spleen are two organs that sit, sit next to each other, and they're about the same size, and there's about the same flow of blood through them, why is it that the liver is one of the most frequent sites of cancer metastases, while the spleen is almost never a site of cancer metastases? I mean, as a Scotsman, is this not related to whiskey intake also? Or? <laughs> I wish it was, but um, well, I, I, the amazing thing is we don't know the answer to that question. So there two, is two vessels immediately next to each other, uh, exactly. geographically in the body, same blood flow, same sort of size, totally different reactions to totally different reactions. So, so in what, some it, ways they're singing out different cells, if you want to call it cancer cells in this case, are singing out completely different songs brilliant. to those two different environments. And so the second use of the song of the cell, and, and you say that. In the sense, we're we beginning to understand the cell itself, but you don't understand how cells relate to each other. That's right, and, and that's the second yeah. use of the word song. I mean, this kind of interrelationship, yes. This uh, interrelationship between cells. So we've been talking, in a sense, in, in theoretical terms. 
your book is full of individual case studies and real human beings. And when we were talking just before coming on stage, you mentioned uh, a child in Bangalore. Do you want to just mention that very moving case you told me about? Uh, yes, we were, we were just talking about it. Um, and it's a case about the, 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 uh, the magic of numbers. Now, I, I, I don't believe in, in sort of cosmic phenomena, but sometimes, sometimes I, I, I take a step back and think about it twice. Um, so we're in the middle of, um, and by saying we, um, um, a group of us um, brought, uh, were the first to bring T cell therapies to India as treatments for cancer, N not available in India before. We um, are running the first phase 2B study of using weaponized T cells against cancer. Very um, we weaponized T cells. Do you want to just yeah? Let me describe that. So, that. so, so you, you take T cells are are very powerful immune cells. They usually recognize viruses and bacteria in the body, but you can genetically engineer them to recognize cancer. And when you do that, you can take cancers that have relapsed and become refractory to chemotherapy, and then make you can cure patients. Right at the beginning of the book, you talk about your friend who had a melanoma on his face. That's right. And, and, and you said that the, the, the cancer, uh, the body couldn't recognize the, that, the threat from that Correct, and, but, but you can override that uh, invisibility cloak of a cancer um, and uh, using genetic engineering. And, and let the body see it for the first time. And let the body see it for the first time. And the, and it's, and the second example I give in the book is Emily Whitehead. In, in her case, of course, that was exactly what's done. She is now, she was seven when she had that therapy um, with relapsed refractory uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a disease that used to carry 100% mortality. She just celebrated her 18th birthday. Um, so a complete, complete miraculous transformation. Um, extraordinarily difficult, and I often say it's like sending a rocket to the moon. So about three years ago, four years ago, um, a group of us, Kiran Shaw, me, Kush Parmar, said, well, this, we should make this therapy available in India. We can send rockets to the moon. We can certainly make T cells and genetically engineer them. So it was a mad project. We set it off in Bangalore. And um, the second patient or third patient, uh, I flew down from the United States to treat this patient. So I go down to the room in Bangalore, um, and I'm opening this, uh, this uh, T cell infusion. I mean, uh, you know, well, I have to tell you, you have to build an ecosystem that is so complex in order to deliver this therapy. And it ends up in a little bag, uh, which looks like you know, a, a, a bag of saline, but nonetheless. So I opened this therapy, I, I, I talk to this kid, and I say, what's your name? And um, he says his name, and he says a name, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you his name, but, um, but I instantly recognize that it's a Bengali name. We're sitting in Bangalore. And I say to him, well, what, what, what do your parents do? And his mom is there, and he says, um, my father is a guard in a hotel. And I said, which hotel? And he says, well, he's the security guard on this one particular floor of the one hotel that I happen to stay in every year in Kolkata. OK? So already I'm a little bit surprised. So um, two years pass, and I'm back last week in Kolkata at the same hotel. Um, and my flight lands. I'm bleary-eyed. I'm like, it's 2 AM in the morning. And um, it's hard for me to say this without sort of falling apart a little bit, but the, the, the father's waiting there for me. On your floor on, of your hotel? On, outside the door of my hotel, 2 AM in the morning. He says, I saw your name on the roster, and I was waiting for you. Um, and I said, well, what's with, what's, what's with the child? And he says, oh, my child, he's alive. His life has been saved. He, you know, he's been living in Kokala, two years gone by. So I said, well, bring him for breakfast tomorrow. And so I met with the child. I showed you the photographs. Of course, I'm not going it's, to, it's private information. But I sometimes think to myself, you know what? You know, I, as I said, I don't have cosmic beliefs. There are 1.3 billion people in India, <laughs> of whom 0.1% are kids with relapsed refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia, of whom 0.1% are children of security guards 
of whom 0.1% are children of security guards who happen to be in the same floor of the place in Kolkata that I have to happen to go to, of whom 0.1% are alive. And, and that was that. And and that, that, was, was, that. that was the child. <laughs> anyway, it's a story that will go down in some kind of canon of history somewhere, and someone else will write it. That, one of the things I loved about the book is, in a sense, it's a kind of completely enormous subject. It, and, and your book, in many ways, is a sort of comprehensive guide to basic biology. But it's also tiny. I mean, it's dealing with, dealing with these tiny, tiny objects, these tiny, tiny <coughs> cells. Talk to me about one of the things you do very well in the book is the history of science. Tell me about Robert Hooke, 17th century, looking down a microscope. What does he see? So Robert Hooke's a funny character. He's a bizarre, a bizarre character. I love these, uh, these um, eccentric um, characters. So Robert Hooke um, is the first person who coins the word cell um, from, the, from, the, from the idea that they look like sort of jail cells. Um, he looks down a microscope. Now, Hooke is, um, he comes to Oxford. Again, small world, bizarre world. Um, when I was at Oxford, I lived in what, what used to be Hooke's old house, the house that, I, that Hooke um, did all his experiments in. But anyway, so Hooke um, is a, a student at Oxford, um, and he begins to look down a microscope. Um, what's astonishing about Hooke is he is an incredible polymath. He's an architect. He is a, a writer. He's a scientific illustrator. He's a microscopist. He's a biologist. Lives, he, lives through the Civil War and all this. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and he rebuilt much of the um, much of London post the uh, post the Great Fire. He was one of the uh, he was the main consultant or one of the main consultants to to Christopher Wren. Um, so Hook. Um, he's also a very unpleasant character, by the way. Um, he has a nasty fight with Newton, um, and the legend goes that um, it's so nasty that when so Hook becomes the president of the of the Royal Society, and when the the offices of the Royal Society move, um, and then Newton becomes a new president, Newton is so irritated with Hook that there's one por portrait of Robert Hook in history, and and the legend goes or uh, the story goes that Newton neglects to move it with him. And it's forever lost. We actually don't know what he looks like. We don't know what Robert Hooks looks like. So anyway, but Robert Hooks does look down the microscope, and he finds these um, these uh, these bodies inside bodies, and that's the that's the origin of, of the cell. And you also introduced us to this character Rudolf Virchow. Yes. Uh, mid 19th century, who is the first to recognize that cancer is cells behaving in a rogue manner. And, and, and no much, matter how we twist and turn, we shall eventually come back to the cell. Yeah, so, so cancer is one of Rudolf Virchow's very important contributions. But Rudolf Virchow is actually a very seminal person in this book. In fact, in the, in, in the, in the prelude or the prologue to the book, I talk about how I almost dedicated this book to Rudolf Virchow. Um, he is um, a, 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 a man who champions liberty. He's, a, you know, he... Um, he, um, uh, he's a scientist, but he's also a social reformer. Um, he plays a very important role in um, resisting the forces of anti-Semitism uh, that are sweeping through Germany um, in, the, um, in the early 20th century. But aside from that, uh, he's, of course, a very important scientist. And the reason he anchors this book is because of, of two things, um, two very central ideas that he brings into the world of biology and perhaps into the world of sciences. And they're interestingly, they're just sort of yin and yang. The, the first idea is that, um, that all normal physiology, you know, people used to wonder about how, how, how do human beings behave? Why, why are we made up the way we are made up? How do muscles contract? How do we, you know, this idea of, human, of, the, of the human body as a machine. And Verkau makes the very radical claim that yes, you can think about the human body as a machine, but the subparts of the machine are cells. So in other words, all physiology is a consequence of cellular physiology. Again, this idea seems to be a little banal um, sometimes, but, but, but let me make it exciting to you, right? So think about, think about its, its applications where things might get really fuzzy. Think about, for instance, I, I've spoken about this in a, in a piece, in The Guardian, think about mental illness, right? Think about depression, schizophrenia. And if you think about mental illness, depression being one of them, 
And you think about Virchow saying that all physiology is the consequence of cellular physiology, and it's Yang's statement, all pathology, all illness is the consequence of cellular pathology, that cells going wrong. All of a sudden, you start looking at the human body, at illness, in a completely different way. Yeah. Um, you think about mental illness in a different way. It's a cellular illness. There can be psychosocial elements to it. There could be whatever elements to it. But all of a sudden, it's somatized. It becomes part of your body. And there's an enormous power to that. You can begin a whole line of investigation. Um, it's a, it's a, it, it can destigmatize. That somatization can destigmatize many things. You know, you know, you don't say slap yourself out of cancer. And by that same logic, you don't say slap yourself out of depression. depression. Yeah, exactly. So, so very important figure in this uh, in this story. On, on this same stage, just before lunch, we had Merlin Sheldrake talking yes, about fungi, uh, and again, you had this sensation of, of um, individual cells doing their own thing, but forming a whole and talking to each other, and huge structures within the, the fungal world communicating with other. When you think, take that thought and, and then relate it to a human being, I mean, are we, are we the ones in charge? Is, are we running the show or are the cells running it and occasionally doing their own thing like cancer uh, and we just have to be, you know, go with it or not? Well, so you're asking kind of, um, I think, several questions in that question. I mean, you're asking a question about autonomy, agency, and then moving on to questions about sentience and, and, and um, potentially about, about consciousness. But I mean, what we know so far is that cells almost certainly have autonomy. There's pretty much no doubt about that. They do their own thing. They do their own thing, yeah. They're, and you can imagine them as nanomachines in our body and us built out of those nanomachines. Um, the good thing, for the most part, is that they, they have a reason to cooperate with each other. Um, otherwise, you and I wouldn't exist. We would float away and become individual cells and disintegrate and become um, individual bacteria, fungi, whatever it might be. Um, so yes, they have autonomy. Um, to some extent, they have agency in the sense that they do things. Um, they do things for a purpose. That in itself is an extraordinary thought. That's cells, a, cells have agency. Exactly. And then you come to sort of um, things that go beyond agency. I mean, are they conscious? Most biologists would say no. Um, but interestingly, groups of cells, um, when they cooperate and interact with each other, for instance, in your brain, they have the emergent property of, the, of allowing things like consciousness to exist. So why is it in a cell's interest to go rogue and, and do cancer? Well, it's, it's, not, it, it's, in, a, it's in a cell's interest in, in, in the sense that, I mean, cancer is an evolutionary disease. Um, and what's... what's What's important about thinking about cancer... They're killing, they're killing their host. What's important about cancer is that, um, you know, if they killed hosts too quickly, um, if there were genes that killed hosts all, all too quickly, then in fact the disease would vanish. What's important about cancer in a, at a genetic or cellular level is that it parasitizes or alters the very genes that are responsible for normal cellular behavior. That's the reason cancer exists in the first place. So again, to think of on a, on a fungal parallel, those, those fungi that infect ants uh -huh. and make them go to the top of a piece of grass and then sprout out a, 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 a fru fruiting uh, branch. Uh, is, is that what cancer cells are doing? They're, they're, they're not killing us immediately, but they're deliberately leading us on a dance? Well, again, I mean, uh, it, it, it's very difficult to use language which has intention in all of this, right? And one has to be very careful about using intentionality. Cancer doesn't have intentionality. It is an evolutionary consequence of cellular behavior. And it's an evolutionary consequence of cellular behavior because cells are designed to survive. Cells are designed to reproduce. Cells are designed to grow. Cancer is parasitizing or using all of those um, properties, those characteristics. But it doesn't have intentionality. It's not in it, it doesn't have any intentionality. It's just an evolutionary consequence. In the same way, I would argue, and maybe Martin can, can, can come in on this, but in the same way that you know, fungi don't have intentionality in making an ant go up an anthill, but it's an evolutionary consequence of, their, of the fact that if they do so, 
the fungi that happen to do so happen to be naturally selected to survive. And they spread. Yeah, and it's very important to use this language. And I, I, I try many, many times in my book to reinsert this language. It's important to use this language not only in biology, but also in medicine and in the social sciences, in political sciences, in history, is to use, is to get away sometimes from the language of agency and intentionality. Because as soon as you get into the language of intentionality, then the victim is to blame, right? You caused your cancer. You are responsible, blah, and, and so forth. And that gets into sort of the human, the natural human tendency towards intentionality. So it's just important to be careful about that and think about cancer as an evolutionary consequence of cellular behavior. But with your work, you can modify a cell. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we've learned lately to do this. Uh, it wasn't possible 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but um, uh, we've learned to do this. And by, by, by that, my own laboratory has learned to do this. Um, several others have. Um, but we've learned to do it slowly. It's taken us a lot of time. We've, uh, you know, and, and, and met with a um, very appropriate degree of, of, of skepticism and resistance. But over the years, over the last five or seven years, we've shown pretty much that you can modify cells um, and even potentially stem cells. You can modify them safely. You can genetically modify them, change their properties, and use them therapeutically, as we've done with that kid who's still living in, in and playing cricket the last I saw him in, in Kolkata. But, and you can also weaponize. You can weaponize. I mean, that is one of the ways you can modify them. You can weaponize them. Explain that. It's such an interesting idea. Well, so, you know, generally speaking, again, to return to the language, the evolutionary language we were talking about, one of the consequences, one of the reasons that cancers can even grow in the first place is that they become, they make themselves, again, in an evolutionary way, to keep away from the language of intentionality, they make themselves, they adapt and survive and become invisible to the immune system. Um, we know this because there are some, there are very rare cases, well documented in, in literature, of cancers that are unable to make themselves invisible to the immune system, and they're spontaneously eliminated. Um, in fact, if you look in the human body, if you look at autopsies um, in humans, um, you'll find all sorts of abnormal cells, cancer cells beginning to, to happen. Um, there's a study, fascinating study, if you look in the thyroid, for instance, um, in autopsy series, 80 to 90% of people um, who have died of other causes, natural causes, will have what would seem like malignant cells in their thyroid. 70% or some very large number will have malignant cells in their breast. Women will have, they've died of other causes. So somehow or the other, the cancers have been born, but they haven't taken root. And we don't know exactly why, but one of the reasons why, there are several reasons, but yeah, one again, of- Again, understanding the cell, but again, not understanding, understanding the, the song relation. of the cell, exactly. But one of the reasons is that there is a phenomenon of immune surveillance. The immune system is not only looking for cells that have been infected by viruses, but it's also looking for potentially malignant cells, including cancer cells. Um, so when you say you weaponize um, a cell against cancer, what you're really trying to do is to make the cancer visible again to the immune system where it had previously become invisible. And you can use genetic, very powerful tools of genetic engineering, um, including modifications of genes, to now make the, to coin a word, to make the previously invisible cancer, the cloaked cancer, revisible to the immune system. That's what I mean by weaponization. But some cells you find intractable. There's a kind of mystery of some that just won't crack open. That's right. So uh, we talked a little bit about, um, I'm sure this has happened to, I mean, there's everyone here. Um, some cells are intractable. You cannot make them, you cannot make, at least yet. Um, and I always say at least yet, because 10 years ago, who would have thought that we could do this for leukemias and lymphomas and myelomas. But here we are, you know, 10 years from there. So I say yet, but you know, some have become, have proved to be extraordinarily intractable to making revisible pancreatic cancer and some other cancers, um, some forms of breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, for instance, very, very tough, tough puzzles to crack um, so far. Do you ever find yourselves coming up against 
ethical issues, such as, you, we, we're now talking about modifying cells. Is that changing what we are as human beings? Is, is this thing, you mentioned um, early on in your book about one of the uh, genius scientists who's in jail because he's crossed ethical lines on, uh, on modifying uh, humans. Yeah. Absolutely, so um, in fact, he just came out of jail uh, last week, but... Um, uh, is he a friend? Uh, no, he's not a friend. <laughs> I was not involved in getting him into jail or getting him out of jail. Um, uh, I, I suggest we keep we, we keep out of <laughs> jailing or non or or getting people out of people out of jail. But anyway, but um, I think um, I mean as we sort of come towards the end of this conversation, um, perhaps I, I can propose um, um, what I call an ethical triangle, and I'm going to propose this. Because this ethical triangle, as we modify genes, modify cells, modify humans, becomes a triangle that's not really within the purview of medicine or biology, but it becomes your problem. Because the stewardship of human beings is not my problem or your problem, or it's, it's a common, it's a shared problem. We are on the edge, and again, I'm gonna repeat this very carefully, we are on the edge of really questioning the level of stewardship we have of our own selves. Um, science is moving faster than you can possibly imagine. Um, the Which in general, in this world, is a good thing, in that cures are possible that were impossible 10 years ago. Um, yeah, on one hand, it's a good thing, but raises, I would, I, I would suggest, uh, profoundly important ethical questions about how we maintain this stewardship and and who the stewards are and, and what their role is. So um, what I've proposed is what I call a triangle of stewardship. Um, and I want people to think about this because this is not a scientific issue. This is a, it's a very fundamental issue about who we are and what we will become. I mean, the triangle of stewardship begins, um, uh, the top edge of the triangle is, is suffering. So the, um, the North Star that, I believe, as a physician and a scientist, as a human being, the North Star to which we should peg any attempts to modify ourselves, to create new humans, is to emancipate suffering. Its opposite, of course, being any form of augmentation, any form of changing human beings to enhance qualities that we don't have or we might desire to have. So there has to be an element of suffering involved. That itself is a gray area. So just to give you some examples, I mean, before IVF was, was invented, in vitro fertilization was invented, lots of people thought that infertility was not a form of suffering, and you could make that argument today. For some people, infertility is not a form of suffering, but for some people it is. So that itself is changing, so we need to have a conversation, a dynamic conversation about what suffering is. But nonetheless, let me peg one of edge of the triangle to suffering, especially to extraordinary suffering. The second edge of the triangle is what I call the edge of scientific determinism, which is to what extent are we sure that we can perform these changes safely? Um, to what extent are we sure that these changes will indeed affect the, 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 the correct um, modification and not create some kind of, you know, if you want to use liter literature, some kind of Frankensteinian moment in, 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 in human history. Um, that's, that's, that's somewhat of a scientific challenge. The third edge of this triangle, I think, is, is, the most, is, is the one that we have the most stewardship of, and that's the humanistic edge. Um, so medical, scientific, and, and the humanistic edge. And that has to do with um, informed consent, um, understanding, um, uh, lack of, so freedom, choice, liberties, um, lack of state mandates, um, lack of coercion, and a full and deep understanding of, of what it means to, 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 to enter the sphere. Now, when we operate within the realm of this ethical triangle, which I've now proposed in two books, um, I think we remain in a relatively safe area. It's when we depart from this triangle, um, when we depart from the North Star of suffering, when we de depart from informed consent, um, uh, when we depart from what is known and unknown about, about the scientific um, challenges, that's when we run into problems. So this is a literary festival. One of the things 
leaving aside the science that astonishes me about these books, uh, these, all three of these extraordinary books, is, is how you construct extraordinary readable, accessible books from very intractable material. I sometimes worry about how to make 18th century politics uh, presentable to, to people that don't know it. But this is much, much more complex stuff, and much more inaccessible. Well, at least it's not. Yeah. Um, so, so talk about your process. How do you start putting these books together? A lot of this stuff begins with New Yorker articles, it seems to be. But, yes, yeah. so um, the New Yorker is a great um, sort of starting place for me because I have, an inc I have incredible editors incredible editors there. But, um, you know, William, I mean, I, th I know you know this as a nonfiction writer. I mean, a lot of writing, and this is true for all writing, including fiction, begins with questions that are not present in the book. Um, questions about, the question that I ask myself is, what's the mood of this book going to be like? And that's a very dreamy question. It's a question that lives in sort of um, things that you cannot articulate. It's inarticulate, uh, an inarticulate question. What's the structure of this book going to be like? What's it going to look like as a skeleton? Um, this book was particularly hard to write because it's the first book in which, um, you know, there's an old, old saying in both fiction and nonfiction writing is, make chronology your friend, make time your friend. Because it'll, it'll tell you how to write a book. You begin at the beginning, you end at the end. Um, that's how I do it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> This book is particularly hard to write because this is not a chronological book. This, in fact, if you think about it structurally, if you think about it in terms of the structure of this book, is a book in which, you know, it's a series of linked short stories. Um, so I tried very hard to sort of straight jacket this book into chronology, but it wouldn't work. And so this book is a, link, a set of linked short stories. Every chapter is a cell. It takes on a cell and becomes the full short story of the cell. There is the, you know, the, the, the cells in your brain, which is the chapter is called the contemplating And how do you get these cells to relate to each other? <laughs> and then the last few chapters are about sort of knitting it all together. Um, the epilogue, which is a long epilogue, but five chapters of epilogue, are about knitting these together and, and trying to figure out the song of the cell. Ladies and gentlemen, we have five more minutes. I'm gonna ask you a question. You've got a choice. Would you like to ask questions, or would you like Sadat to read an extraordinarily beautiful passage from his books? Those that would like to ask questions, put their hands up. Those that would like a reading, put their hand up. Oh dear. The reading wins. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, so, um, I mean, part of, this, part of this is also, you know, my books are unusual, I think, to write for me, um, because I string together um, m both memoir, um, deep history, philosophy, often um, Indian philosophy, sometimes music, um, poetry, I, 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 even some mythology. And mythology, yeah. exactly. Um, and I, I, I sort of, it, I, I, you know, um, I, in Kolkata I said, you know, Bengalis have this dish um, called trachuri. Um, which is uh, uh, notoriously difficult to make because it's a melange. Um, so, so these books, you can think about my attempts to make a, a liter literary version of this. So this is from the memoir portion of the book, um, which I'm going to read. It's going to be a four-minute reading. So this is me um, um, back at Oxford when I'm sort of beginning to learn about cells and, and, and learn about um, about what happens. Alan Townsend's lab sat atop a steep hill at the Institute for Molecular Medicine at the edge of Oxford University. In the fall of 93, when I arrived at Oxford to study it with Alan as a graduate student in immunology, the mysteries of T cell function were still being deciphered. The Institute was a modernist steel and glass building. The security guard at the front desk, a woman with a thick Welsh accent, which you can probably do, um, checked IDs before letting you in. Without the right card, she would refuse to let you enter. Two years passed with me fumbling through my pocket for the card until I finally got the courage to confront her. I had been there every day for 24 straight months. Didn't she recognize me by my face? She looked at me stonily. I'm just doing my job. Her job, I suppose, was to detect intruders as if I might well have been James Bond, who'd driven up the hill in an Aston Martin on a top secret mission to feed my T-cell cultures at night. 
In retrospect, I've grown to appreciate her diligence. She had internalized immunity. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. An Italian postdoc, Vincenzo Cirundolo, was my direct mentor. Cerundolo, known as Enzo, was short, garrulous, and effervescent. And yet, during my first weeks in the lab, he ignored me entirely. He rushed around the lab, navigating his way past me, as if I were some irritating piece of lab equipment that someone had offloaded in the wrong place. He was finishing a research paper and teaching a freshly arrived graduate student the details of immunology seemed hardly worth his time. One aspect of Enzo's project involved manufacturing viruses to infect mouse and human cells. To expand the virus, that is to make more viral particles so that he could do this experiment, you had to infect a layer of cells and then you extracted the virus by placing the whole culture in a tube and freezing and thawing it exactly three times. It was a procedure that required precision and patience. Without freeze thawing, you couldn't release enough, but if you overdid the process, you might kill the virus entirely and the entire experiment would go to waste. One morning, soon after I arrived, I found Enzo fussing over one such tube. A research technician, also Italian, had made a prep, but she had left for a vacation. Enzo had no idea whether the virus had been extracted or whether the tube had been left without the process. It was a tense moment. A low viral count and the whole experiment critical to the paper would go down the drain. He cussed under his breath in Italian, cavolo. By the way, I was in Kolkata, and someone came and asked me, well, what other cuss words do you know in Italian? And I told him several others. Um, anyway, I asked Enzo if I could look at the tube, and he handed it to me. And on its bottom, in barely visible ink, I saw that the technician had scribbled the letters CS, CS, CS. What's the word for freeze in Italian, I asked him. Congelare, Enzo replied. And for thaw, scongelare. So that's what the technician had written, I, I, I thought. Freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, except in a kind of Morse code, CS, 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 three times each. Enzo regarded me sharply. Perhaps I wasn't a waste of time after all. He finished his experiment and asked me if I wanted a coffee, and he made two cups. Something had thawed between us. We'll move a little bit ahead. In early 2019, I learned that Enzo had been diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. The news of his illness numbed me with shock. I couldn't bring myself to call him for days. A week passed, perhaps two, until I finally dialed his number from New York. He picked up immediately. He was matter of fact about his condition. Perhaps those T cells whose inner mysteries he had spent his life uncovering would find a way to fight his cancer. As Alan Townsend, my mentor, wrote about Enzo in, the, in a journal, one hears the phrase, fight with cancer, but this description is a pale shadow of the intense, personal, grinding immunological battle he waged with the rebellious cells that challenged him. He did this unperturbed, never missing a seminar, always available to students and colleagues. It was a demonstration of supreme courage. In 2020, a few weeks before I was about to visit Oxford to give a talk, I found out that Enzo had died. I canceled my trip. That evening, I sat in the lab silently, recalling my mentor, my friend, holding back the memories until they had hardened. I felt dazed and then desiccated, congealed in gloom. It was only then, hours later, that the grief burst in me in wave upon liquid wave. Congelare, Enzo. It's congelare. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Siddhartha Mukherjee. We'll be signing books in the tent afterwards. And I highly recommend you go buy his book. <laughs> All three of them. We would like to thank Siddhartha Mukherjee and William Dalrymple for this wonderful, enlightening session. A huge round of applause for Siddhartha Mukherjee and William Dalrymple. Please grab your copies from Full Circle. He'll be available for signing books at the book signing decks on my right hand side, please. There it is.